test. <laughs> Too early. It's yeah. normal time, isn't it? <laughs> cool. Well, I know. I hear you. <laughs> this is the one day a week I make it happen. Cool. Well, you can. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who makes all things new, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin.
Holy One, source of our renewal, we confess that we are wrapped up in sin and cannot free ourselves. We have not practiced your righteousness. Our hearts have turned away from you. For the sake of the world you so love, forgive us that we may be reconciled to one another for the glory of your holy name. Amen. Thus says our God, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. God's mercy makes us new. We are forgiven in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, you confound the world's wisdom in giving your kingdom to the lowly and the pure in heart. Give us such a hunger and thirst for justice and perseverance in striving for peace, that in our words and deeds the world may see the life of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let's sing together, All Earth is Hopeful, ELW number 266. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, folks on Facebook. We have a new AV setup that we're trying out today. Hopefully it will improve our audio tremendously, um, but be sure to comment in the video um, if you're having trouble seeing or hearing. Um, we'll try and get that fixed for next week. Also, if you're with us, go ahead and if you're visiting with us, fill out one of these yellow cards. If you have a prayer request that you know of, uh, make sure you fill out one of these white cards and you can just put those in the offering plate um, when that comes round. Until then, kids, come on up. I want to read you a story today. One of my favorite books. Yeah, you can bring your squash mellow. Ooh, it's like a hot chocolate version. Ooh, ooh, I got a fruit snack and a goldfish. I will not eat those at the same time. They will not go good together, but I'll eat them separately. Look, it's Cupcake Mickey. It is Cupcake Mickey, I love it. I got it from Ah, is this on? Chook, 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 yeah, it's on. Chook. Okay, this is one of my favorite books. It's called God's Dream. You see the kids on the cover? Pretty good. This is by uh, Desmond Tutu and Carlton Abrams. And then uh, 
Leuian Tham, I hope I'm, I don't, I'm sure I'm not saying that right, um, illustrated the book. So that means they drew the pictures. Okay, here we go. Dear child of God, what do you dream about in your loveliest of dreams? Do you dream about flying high or rainbows reaching across the sky? I'm not good at reading upside down. That's why I'm going to read it and then show you the pictures. Do you dream about being free to do what your heart desires or about being treated like a full person, no matter how young you might be? Yeah. Do you know what God dreams about? If you close your eyes and look with your heart, I'm sure, dear child, that you will find out. See them closing their eyes? They want to know what God dreams about, right? I think we do too. I want to know what it is about. God dreams about people sharing. God dreams about people caring. Yeah, we can care for people and kitties, right? And dogs. And people that are different from you, you can say that right? It's true. Now, God dreams that we reach out and hold one another's hands and play one another's games and laugh with one another's hearts, but God does not force us to be friends or to love one another. Forever. Hmm. Interesting. God doesn't force us to be friends or to love one another. Dear child of God, it does happen that we get angry and we hurt one another, and soon we start to feel sad and so very alone. <coughs> you see this little kid down here? Yeah, he took the bow from the tree. Don't worry, I'm coming. See over here? He took the, he took the bow from that boy. Could be. Could be. Because in the next day, they saw them playing basketball. He was chasing the ball, oh. and the boy was holding the basketball. So that wasn't nice, right? Sometimes we do things that aren't nice. And sometimes we cry, and God cries with us. But when we say we're sorry and forgive one another, we wipe away our tears and God's tears, too. Look at She apologized, and he's forgiving her. She's wiping away his tears. Yeah, yeah the dog and cat are my favorite characters. <laughs> Look at those kissing. Those, they just got married. Sometimes dogs and cats don't like each other, but maybe they forgive each other too. Now, each of us carries a piece of God's heart inside us. And when we love one another, the pieces of God's heart are made whole. Look at Yo, those two that? kids. Now they're coming into the circle and they're making the heart complete. Wait, they made the heart? Yeah, you see the heart shape? Like this? Is this the piece missing? Yeah, and they're coming in. You see them running in? Yeah. Yeah. God dreams that every one of us will see that we are all brothers and sisters, even you and me. Even if we have different mommies and daddies or live in different far away lands. Yeah. They love each other. Like brothers and sisters. <laughs> But you know what? Everybody in the world is a brother and sister in God's eyes. Everybody in the world is part of God's family. Oh, that's so gross. <laughs> well, here's one that's not gross. Even if we speak different languages or if we have different ways of talking to God, even if we have different eyes or different skin, look at all these different kinds of kids. God loves them all. They're all a part of God's family. Just like you and me. Yeah. Even if you're taller and I'm smaller, even if your nose is little and mine is big, yeah. dear child of God, do you know how to make God's dream come true? It's really quite easy. 
God dreams that all of God's children love each other. As easy as sharing, loving, caring, as easy as holding, playing, and laughing, as easy as knowing that we are family because we are all God's children. Yeah. Everybody. Will you help God's dream come true? Let me tell you a secret. Are you good at keeping secrets? Hey, that's the page that's on the front. It is the page that's on the front. Good eye. Let me see. Go back. This is the secret. God smiles like a rainbow that's, when you do. That's a rainbow, right, Norman? That's, yeah. That's Oh, do you have one of these in daycare? Yeah. That's really cool. No. But, the, but, the, but they have heads on this one, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's like the one in rainbow. But, but, the, but they will not have. But you no, know what? they will have. No. Every time you see a rainbow, you know what that means? What? It means God loves you. Now, today in the Bible, we're going to hear that Jesus is talking to some people, and he's going to say a lot of things like, blessed are the something. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He's going to say all those things. Because there are all different kinds of people in the world with all different kinds of needs, and God loves them all and wants us all to help take care of them. Can we say a prayer? Okay, let's do it. Repeat after me. Congregation, I'm going to have you help too. Dear God, thank you so much for loving everybody, including me and all different kinds of people. Please help us love them too. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to my favorite story. You can head back to your chairs. Yeah. <laughs> Our first reading today is from Micah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised. What Balaam, son of Beor answered him, and what happens from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks, thanks be to God. God. Please help me in reading responsibly Psalm 15. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle, who may abide upon your holy hill, those who lead a blameless life and do what is right, who speak the truth from their heart, 
They do not slander with the tongue. They do no evil to their friends. They do not cast discredit upon a neighbor. In their sight, the wicked are rejected, but they honor those who fear the Lord. They have sworn upon their health and do not take back their word. They do not give their money in hope of gain, nor do they take bribes against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be overthrown. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 23. The message upon the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated. This is a day of favorites for me. Let's talk about one of my favorite passages from the Bible, this text from Micah. It's a pretty famous text, especially the last lines in verse 8. It says, do justice 
love kindness, walk humbly with your God. Are these verses familiar for anyone? Show of hands. Oh, maybe not so famous then, huh? <laughs> now this week I heard a colleague describe this verse as Micah's bumper sticker verse, meaning that for good or for bad, people have lifted these words out of context a lot as an encapsulation of God's call to us God's followers. One scholar says that this verse sums up, quote, biblical ethics in a nutshell. I think of it as like Christ's commandment to love one another. Do you remember this story? Someone comes up to Jesus and they're trying to trick him into a wrong answer uh, with a trick question. They say, what's the most important commandment? And Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and with all your mind. The second is the, this is the greatest and first commandment, and second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. So that's in Matthew 22. Um, this word in Micah is kind of like that in that it's an encapsulation of all of the law, all of what uh, is in the spirit of God's call to love our neighbor. In particular, the eighth verse and the sixth chapter are a summation of God's law. This is how, in a nutshell, as John Collins would say, we should be showing up for God and for each other. Cool. Let's slap that sticker on our water bottle or on our bumper and call it a day. See, this is the problem with the pithy, obsessed way that we interact with the Bible. We love finding a couple of words and ripping them out of context. We find a couple of words that strike us, we rip them out of context, and we place them wherever it's most convenient. But I promise you that learning about the context through our most favorite and beloved verses will enrich our spirit. Our confirmation students are doing just this. They're choosing faith verses, and they're going to do some research into where those come from and to do some contextualizing for those. Because when we learn about history and authorship and language and other nuances for our favorite verses, our hearts get opened again and again and again to new ways of hearing God's voice. So let's look at Micah, and in particular, this particular part of Micah in chapter 6. Now, when we think of prophets in the Old Testament, we usually, and mostly rightly, think of city prophets. Those uh, who live in Jerusalem have the ear of the powerful and the wealthy. We think of Nathan and Jeremiah. We think of Elijah, who criticizes the whole of the religious leaders. And Micah is like these prophets in a lot of ways. He prophesies directly to the political and religious leaders of his day. But at the heart of Micah, and at the heart of his upbringing, Micah is not, as Billy Crystal would call, a city slicker. <laughs> Micah is a product of rural life. He grew up in the countryside and uh, grew up away from the ways of city living. Micah brings to the courts and to the temple the valuable insight of a farmer, of someone who connects with the land and natural resources differently than someone who goes to the marketplace for food, and the perspective of someone who had to fend for themselves against the weather, against the wolves, and against also unfriendly passers-by. So this prophet Micah then comes to the city to speak God's word to those in power. And this happens at a very specific moment in the life of God's people. You might remember a sermon of mine a few weeks ago. I reminded us there was a splitting in the Israelite kingdom into two kingdoms. There was for a time both a northern kingdom of Israel and a southern kingdom of Judah. I don't know if this is ringing bells with you or not. I won't quiz you. <laughs> Now, the pro political intrigue of this situation is pretty complex. I'm not going to remind you of all of the details now, um, but Micah is speaking into this particular reality. He's actually prophesying to both Israel in the north and Judah in the south right at the moment when the Assyrian Empire is conquering the northern kingdom, the northern half of God's people. There are large empires circling these two small kingdoms, circling like wolves around two small sheep, and they're hovering at the gates. The walls are closing in. Fear is a constant in the life of an Israelite right now. Everyone is wondering when the other shoe is going to drop and when they're going to be crushed by military forces stronger than themselves. This is a dark and fearful time to live in either the northern or the southern kingdom. 
And in Micah's fourth chapter, the prophet tempers this fear a little bit with a promise from God that it will not be like this forever, that there will come a time when people will be able to, quote, sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid. There will come a time when they will have no more need of weapons. God's going to turn their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Micah, on one hand, is bringing a word of hope to a nation deeply afraid of annihilation. But Micah is also critical of what's been happening inside of these kingdoms. Yes, the fear is real, but fear is no excuse for forgetting about God or God's commandments. And so the first couple of chapters describe the political and economic evil that people of of power have been imposing on the most vulnerable, the widows, the orphans, the poor, the destitute, the sick, the lowly. So even though there's this word of hope in chapter 4, an assurance from God that God will not let foreign powers annihilate the Israelite people, there's also, in these chapters, a critique of the ways God's people have wandered from the path of righteousness laid out for them in the law. Remember that Micah is prophesying to the political and religious elites, not to the people that they walk all over, If chapter 4 is a word of hope, then chapter 6 is a rebuke and a call to reclaim their duty to serve the most vulnerable people in their kingdoms. We pull out the 8th verse because it really does sum everything up about what God would have us do. But it also leaves out the uncomfortable bits. When we isolate that one verse or half of that one verse, we lose the bit that convicts ourselves. And for many of us, myself included, we'd slap this verse on our bumper as a reminder to the jerk behind us to stop riding our tail while we, in the heat of our own rage, would drive inches from the person ahead of us. Most of the sixth chapter is a convicting and thought-provoking message, asking us ourselves to examine our own lives and what we're doing to either hinder or support God's work to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly. With what, Micah asks, shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before God with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? The people in Micah's time, in particular the political and religious elite, We're using these rituals and liturgy and sacrifices as an excuse to forget about caring for their neighbor. They would rather sacrifice a bit of their fortune on the altar than give to the poor. They'd rather kill a ram and eat it in the name of God than acknowledge the hungry poor just outside their door. This is an important part of this beloved verse's context because it's also a convicting part for us even, modern readers. Have we ever counted Sunday morning worship as our God duty for the week? Have we ever used our worship as an excuse not to participate in caring for the vulnerable? As Micah would say, with what shall I come before the Lord? Should I come to God with my head bowed and hands folded in prayer? Should I sing my favorite hymns? Should I dress to the nines? Should I bring my friends to sample a potluck? To all of this, yes, sure but only if we're also tending to the sick, hungry, underhoused, imprisoned, and lonely. The reminder to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God are not just words for others to hear, they're words for us to hear as well. For those living in comfort or relative comfort, it can be easy to hold on to the words of hope from chapter 4 and wait it out until that promised something different comes. But Micah asks the question, what about those who can't wait? What about those who don't know where their next meal will come from? What about those who live outside when it's below zero? And the list goes on. Micah speaks a hope for the future in chapter 4. And in chapter 6, he calls on God's followers to effect change in the present without a second to lose. For us, those on the receiving end of Micah's prophecy, we're invited to wonder about the ways 
We can change our habits to affect positive change in the world. What's one thing I can do better to serve the vulnerable persons around me? For each of us, the answer will be different. For each of us, the answer might be uncomfortable. For all of us, the answer is an essential part of building up God's kingdom. I know and give thanks that this congregation already does amazing ministry, especially with food insecure folks in the area. We contribute regularly to food and toiletry drives and pride ourselves on the positive presence that we've been for others. Praise God for you and for your ministries in this community. And as hard as it is to hear, Micah reminds us that God asks yet more of us, always more. This is the burden of knowing a God that has never-ending love, of knowing deeply an infinite source of goodness and connection with others. Following God is always a challenge. For every good deed and faithful step, there are a million more unmet needs around us and a whole unwalked path ahead of us. Before you get overwhelmed with all of this, Remember that none of us walk alone. We are called to do our best. Our actual best, which is the challenge. But we're also called to do it alongside a worldwide family of God followers who share a same commitment to doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God. It's my prayer that we may all find our own way to live into the spirit of Micah's prophecy. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able and sing another of my favorites, Canticle of the Turning, number 723.
Please join with me in the Apostles' Creed. Let us together proclaim the faith that we share with others around the world. I believe in Jesus, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called together to follow Jesus, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Cultivate humility in your church. In gatherings of every size, teach us to boast only in the cross. Shape your church to be people of kindness, generosity, and justice. Merciful God, receive our prayer. The foundations of the earth bear witness to your faithfulness. The mountains and hills echo with your holiness. When we mistreat your creation, show us the error of our ways. Inspire us with reverent awe to honor all you have made. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You make foolish the wisdom of the world. Raise up honorable leaders who seek justice, love mercy, and pursue peace. Frustrate plans that are corrupt, wicked, and self-seeking. Prosper the work of peacemakers. Merciful God. We bring to you our needs and hopes, O oh God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Let's take a moment to share that peace with those around us. Can't forget about the folks on Facebook on three. Peace back there. One, two, three. Peace. Peace. <laughs> yeah, perfect. All right. We are about to receive offering. Um, we are going to have our noisy offering per usual. Let's make it extra noisy today, okay? okay. All right. All of that noisy offering goes to Camp Onomia, um, our outdoor ministry. Um, and can I get our offering helpers? Let's see. Who do we got today? One, two, three. Oh, perfect. Emily's here, too. All right. Let's do it.
throw. I invite you to please stand as you are able. And please join me in our offering prayer. Liberating God, you break the bonds of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Receive these offerings and thanksgiving for all your works of merciful power and shape us as people of your justice and freedom. You we magnify and adore through Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The God who faithfully brings forth justice and breaks the oppressor's rod, bless, strengthen, and uphold you today and always. Amen. You may be seated for announcements time. Uh, I have quite a few announcements, actually. Um, one week from today, February 5th, uh, we'll be installing our brand new Redeemer Council. Um, and so mark it on your calendars. I would love to have a great showing of support for them. Um, also, I didn't have time to print it before worship, so give me a moment after worship to print it. Um, but I have some thank you notes that I would like to sign for Jeremy and Patrick, who have been serving um, as president and secretary um, in that order, respectively. Um, so write some fun words for them. Um, and we'll give them those thank you cards next week. Um, you've heard of the Super Bowl, right? Have you heard of the Pooper Bowl? Yeah, you've heard of the Pooper Bowl? Oh, I thought I was being original. All right, well, we're having our very own Pooper Bowl. And if you're wondering what that means, and if you're getting grossed out, we're just collecting paper products to donate, okay? Um, so bring them to church. We'll make sure that they get to where they need to go. On Saturday the 18th, there's a quilting and potluck time in the morning from like 9 to noon, I think it is. Details are in your bulletin. Um, but if you wanted to try your hand at sewing, if you want to learn something fun, if you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself and also have some delicious food, um, that's a great place to take part. The following day, if you get hungry two days in a row, this will be a perfect weekend for you, right? Um, we have a We Care, our annual brunch is on the 19th after worship, so make sure you mark that in your calendars too. Um, speaking of food, hanging on that trend, um, all of February we're collecting money to donate to food shelves and to ELCA World Hunger Relief. Um, so if you would like to donate to that, um, just make sure that you put a note. Um, if you put it in an envelope or if you make a memo in your check, just make sure that we know where it's supposed to go, if it's supposed to go to food shelves, if it's supposed to go to ELCA World Hunger, uh, make sure we know where that's supposed to go. Um, there's going to be a blood drive in April. Um, you'll find some red colored posters, very appropriate, um, on some of the doors to the, the church. So I think that's April 27th. Does that sound right? Great. Yeah, you can sign up anytime. You, you, then you get the slot you want. That's right. That's right. Um, my last announcement before I open it up to others is that we're looking for people to host our Lenten meals on Wednesday nights during Lent. Ash Wednesday is coming up on the 22nd already of February. Um, so that sign up is on the doors to the sanctuary um, right outside here. Good. Are there any other announcements that I'm missing or forgetting or don't know about? <laughs> cool. I invite you to please stand as you are able and let's sing together, Rise Up, O Saints of God, 669.
be to God.